Welcome. Well, hello, Crusaders. Wherever you may be Zooming in from, I want to welcome you to today's historical tour of our beloved Holy Cross, titled Hidden Virtually in Plain Sight, Part 2. My name is Tom Cadigan. I serve as the Associate Director in the Office of Alumni Relations, and I am also a proud member of the Class of 2002. Wow, a sequel! I am humbled by the response to this campus tour idea. I cannot thank you enough for your interest in the material and for your encouragement. This has been a fun project. I recently told a classmate of mine, whom I always considered to be a close friend, that I was undertaking a part two of this Holy Cross tour. And he flat out told me, remember, most sequels aren't very good. So much for the Jesuit ideals of men and women for others. Well, though I may not hit the mark, I will aspire to emulate the high sequel standards of The Godfather Part Two, or more recently, Toy Story Two, and try not to plummet to the horrific depths of Jaws the Revenge. That's Jaws 4 for any of you shark enthusiasts. More seriously, I'm so happy to be with you today. We'll be together for just over an hour. I encourage you to use the chat function located on your toolbar to introduce yourself and communicate with fellow alumni, parents, and friends throughout this presentation. You're also welcome to submit questions at any time using the Q&A function also on your toolbar. I will set aside time at the end to try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Now, as we did with the last tour, I wanna to start by briefly acknowledging our tour's true architect, the late Father Tony Kuznevsky. Father K, as many affectionately called him, was a beloved faculty member in the college's history department for several decades. He was also a longtime athletic chaplain and friend to numerous students, alumni, and families. He sadly passed away in 2016, but his memory certainly lives on. Now, Father K developed the framework for this tour as a way to educate students about the college and the campus we call home during our four years on Mount St. James. Now, many of us walk past buildings, statues, and other campus objects and may not know A, what they are, or B, how they relate to Holy Cross's history, our history. This tour aims to educate and expand our collective horizons and deepen our love for Alma Mater. Now, Father Kay would be proud. Similar to the last time, I wanna start with a pop quiz, but don't worry, this won't be graded your diplomas won't be revoked. All right, I am gonna pull up a question and I want you to do your best to try to answer it. All right, you should see that on your screen. Which campus building was the first to be designed and constructed with electricity? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Told you this would be interactive, this is gonna be fun. Which campus building was the first to be designed and constructed with electricity? I feel like we need Alex Trebek here counting us down. I'll take another couple seconds for you to put in your best, best guesses. We're jumping right in today. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share the results with you, which you should see. All right. 37% said Alumni Hall. We have some that say O'Kane, some Dianin, some St. Joseph. So Alumni Hall won. And I have to say, if you guessed Alumni Hall, you are correct. That's where we're gonna begin our journey today. Alumni Hall, the first building on campus to be designed and constructed with electricity. Now, 
lights um, had been on the Holy Cross campus since around 1890, mostly for outside lighting. Um, and by 1904, a year before Alumni Hall opened its doors, electricity was in use in the Fenwick Hall Chapel. But Alumni was the first building truly designed with electricity in mind. Um, but what's interesting is in those first few years, um, the, the, it was a little duplicitous. Um, the switches for both the corridors and the student dormitories were located in the Jesuit prefect's room. So when father said lights out, he really meant lights out. Um, now, alumni, um, the, the, the kind of what, what brought alumni um, to the forefront was at the turn of the century, the rising enrollment um, at Holy Cross. By 1902, the enrollment at the school was at 212, which made Holy Cross at the time the largest Jesuit college in the nation. Now think about that. I, I, I was doing some research. So today, Loyola Chicago, a wonderful Jesuit institution in the Midwest, has an undergraduate population of around 12,000. So the thought that at one point, our Holy Cross was the largest Jesuit college is, is quite impressive. Um, those same statistics, so that was 1902, we had 212 students. BC, that same year, which certainly is much larger than us today, only had about 140 students. Um, so because of this need for space, um, that gave the, uh, the, the administration the impetus to build what became Alumni Hall. Um, when, when I was a student, um, my father and I would often joke, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a building on campus named after us? Um, you know, knowing the Cadigan finances, that check would certainly bounce higher than the, than, than the spires of Fenwick. But um, probably many people have that fantasy. And with alumni in place, we can all comfortably say, all of us who are graduates can comfortably say that we technically do have a building named after us. Um, the, the, the money raised, the primary fundraising for this building was through alumni support. Um, and I included a copy of the, uh, of the cornerstone inscription um, that was put in place about a year before the building opened its doors. It's in Latin, um, but it's, it's roughly translated, this first stone testifies to the devotion of the alumni of Holy Cross toward Alma Mater, 1904. Um, so we can all say that we have at least one building named after us on campus, all of us alumni on the line. Um, another interesting thing about alumni before I move on um, is the cupola. Um, it's always fascinated me. Um, and I know in, in looking over Father Kuznevsky's research and in trying to um, delve more deeply into the reason why a cupola was added, um, this is just the Tom Cadigan speculation, but I wonder if it was added as a nod to the past. Um, if you remember from our past tour, we talked a little bit about the original Fenwick Hall before it was burnt down um, in a terrible fire in 1852. It sported a cupola. Um, and when the fundraising drive for Alumni Hall was in full swing, a lot of those students who would have been um, you know, anywhere from 11 years old to maybe 18 years old, um, a number of those students who knew and remembered the original Fenwick Hall would have been alumni. Um, and I often wonder if the cupola on alumni is, is a nod to that, to that past. Who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to verify that someday. Um, the building was built architecturally in the style of the Italian Renaissance. Um, and about 20 years later, when what became known as Carlin Hall was built, Carlin also has a cupola. But it's just a, it's a connection to the college's past that um, I, I always like to point out on tours like this, that, that, that very striking cupola and its very similar um, connections to, to Fenwick Hall. 
um, another building that is very much iconic um, is O'Kane. Um, you know, you, you see this a lot in our, on our website and in missions brochures and other kind of college um, materials. Um, O'Kane, which opened its doors in 1896, uh, excuse me, in 1895, we can comfortably say was the longest construction project on campus. Um, the building project began in 1891. It didn't open its doors until four years later, but there's some interesting quirks along the way that I want to point out. And the reason for the delay in the construction was really threefold. It was financial, it was political, and it was logistical as well. First financial, literally, the administration at Holy Cross ran out of money. Um, you know, today that seems unfathomable that you're gonna begin a building project and not have enough funds to, to see it through, but that's what happened. Um, number two, political, um, in the 1870s, 1880s, um, there was political turmoil over in Europe facing the Jesuits. In fact, the Italian parliament in the 1870s kicked the Jesuits out of Rome, seized all their property, um, and essentially the, the, the global society of Jesus um, was operating from, from Spain, pretty much a makeshift headquarters. Um, and this political upheaval in the society of Jesus leads to the logistical reasons for O'Kane's delay. Um, and that is any decision, um, which we might think would be mundane, small, had to be approved from, from Jesuit superiors in Europe. Um, and remember, this is, this is the 1890s. Um, you couldn't just Zoom um, with, with the superior general in Rome. Um, you couldn't send an email. You couldn't even pick up a telephone. Um, so most of the correspondence was done by either letters or through telegraph, which was still very new at the time. Um, so those three reasons, the financial reasons, the political upheaval in Europe, and then also the logistical problems um, led to a four-year delay um, in, in O'Kane finally being able to open its doors. Um, when it eventually did in 1895, um, it was the home to the campus's rector's office. There were science laboratories and other classrooms on the ground floor. Um, there were dormitories up on the top floor and there was also an 800 person meeting hall, which would eventually become what is today Fenwick Theater. Um, but what's interesting is when the, when, when the doors were opened for, for O'Kane um, in 1895, technically the project wasn't done. Um, and it wouldn't be for another century until we finally could close the doors on the, uh, on the construction plans. And that was the addition of the clock. Um, they were in the original plans. And for some reason, for a hundred years, um, the clock was never added. It was added finally in 1994 in honor of the college's 150th anniversary. So yeah, the project took four years to get from putting a hole in the ground to opening the doors but technically, we weren't able to put a bow on it for another 100 years or so. Just like to point that out. It's kind of a little fun fact about O'Kane. Um, now, similar to other kind of original campus buildings, and we, we could consider O'Kane to be one of the original campus buildings, um, its, its use has been adapted over the years, serving multiple purposes, and transforming with the needs to meet its students, its space, and whatnot. Um, I love to show this picture. Um, on the upper left, that's the original O'Kane Gymnasium, um, as it looked when the doors were opened in 1895. Um, at the time, it was considered one of the largest gymnasiums in New England. It was 139 feet long, and it sported an elevated track um, that was just over half a mile long. Um, now, over the decades, you know, the needs of the space have, have changed, and that gymnasium 
is now referred to as the pit, um, used by the theater department for acting, directing, designing classes, as well as guest artist performances. Um, so the space has seen some configuration or reconfiguration, um, but you could actually make out the, uh, the pillars, the original pillars, um, both in the top and in the bottom photo. Um, so that's an example of um, kind of changing with the times, changing your space with the times. Um, another thing about O'Kane that really fascinates me is what didn't make it into the final um, into the final design. Um, you know, we talked about the clock tower, and we talked about how that was a a, a lengthy process to get that done. Um, but in the original plans of the O'Kane building, there was area carved out for a swimming pool. Um, it never opened. Um, it was too expensive. Um, there were problems with the, with the drainage system and leaking and things like that. Um, but at least the shell of the pool was put in place. Um, and it's used today as the campus's dance studio. Um, so if you can imagine kind of this space with its windows kind of being a, a pool, um, that's how it was originally drawn up. Um, down in the basement, almost across from um, where the um, where the gymnasium was originally uh, was originally housed. Um, so again, these are these are little quirks about the building that I like to point out. But my favorite, my favorite O'Kane story. Um, again, another example of an unfinished project um, was a campus observatory. Yep, a campus observatory. When I learned about this, this blew my mind. Um, a rendering of the proposed O'Kane building in its early stages shows the unmistakable dome of an observatory on the northern corner. So think of um, you know the the upper the upper photo is almost as if you're 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 exiting the um, the Carlin Bridge. If you look straight up, you see that very much square flat part of the roof. Um, that's where the observatory was going to be located. On the bottom right, um, this is a photo taken from the spring. Um, remember, I was a history major. I'm not a graphic design specialist, but this is my weak attempt. Um, to show where the observatory was to be located. Um, and when, when Father Kuznevsky pointed that out to me, um, I, now I can't stop looking at O'Kane without noticing that kind of strange square that juts out from the, uh, from the roof. Um, and you might say, well, why an observatory? Why was that important? Why was that necessary? Well, it can be argued that the Jesuits emulating St. Ignatius's deep admiration for the universe um, and for the study of God in the natural world, um, have followed his footsteps in scanning the skies, studying the stars, studying the planets. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of a natural to have an observatory on a Jesuit campus. Um, so those got scrapped from the O'Kane plans, and it would take the campus another 50 years or so before it finally got its observatory. Um, and some of you who are on the call might, might remember this in the upper, upper right-hand corner. Um, in 1948, um, led by Father James Connolly, pictured on the bottom, uh, bottom left, he was a faculty member in the physics department, um, an observatory was built above an, on, on the roof of an old campus barn behind the chapel behind St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Um, and it was in use there for probably about 20, 25 years or so um, until that space became the focal point um, of a building project that became Loyola Hall um, in, in the early 60s. Loyola was built um, as a residence hall for the Jesuit community and also as a campus infirmary. Um, so when plans for Loyola started to take shape, um, Mount Connolly, as the observatory was, was uh, popularly described as, um, was plucked off the roof of that old barn um, and relocated 
to an area where it, where it sat for another 30 years or so. The barn was dismantled and Loyola Hall was built on that spot. The observatory in its relocated place um, was, was in use off and on um, until 1980 when it was eventually torn down and the space where Mount Connolly resided is now the Loyola parking lot. Um, so it's kind of a convoluted story from O'Kane to the back of a uh, barn behind the chapel to, uh, to the Loyola parking lot, but that's kind of the infamous story of the campus observatory. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a fun one. For, for some reason, there, there hasn't been another observatory for, for 40 years or so. Um, and, but it was kind of a key component of the, uh, of the physics department and, and Father Connolly, um, a member of that department was kind of the driving force in trying to get one on campus. Um, now you see the photo on, on the lower left, that's Loyola Hall. Speaking of Loyola, um, since the college's founding, there have been many, many myths and tall tales of epic campus pranks involving clever, precocious, oftentimes intoxicated students, but little evidence exists that they really happened, these epic pranks, that they really happened at least to the extent claimed other through hearsay. But there is one legendary prank that is a cut above, and it involves the construction of Loyola Hall, pictured on the bottom, which we were talking about in relation to the observatory. So this prank involves the construction of Loyola nearby Lehigh Hall um, and some shrewd and stealth seniors from the class of 1964 who probably had a little too much idle time on their hands. Now I'll set the scene. The incident took place in May 1964, right in the middle of final exams and actually just a few weeks before the class of 64 were to graduate. Now students on this fateful spring May night confiscated cinder blocks from the Loyola Hall construction site and somehow uphill smuggled them into the Lehigh Hall dormitory. Now if anyone is familiar with the lay of the land on campus, you know that as the crow flies, the distance from Loyola to Lehigh is maybe 200 yards, two football fields if that. But the topography is a challenge. That's probably, you can argue, one of the steepest hills on campus from the level where Loyola is to where Lehigh is situated. So the fact that these students were able to smuggle cinder blocks, get them uphill in the dead of night into Lehigh Hall, that in itself is a, is, is a pretty remarkable feat. Um, but once the blocks were on the Lehigh Two floor, the seniors then mixed a batch of cement and quietly, stealthily bricked up the outer doorway to the Jesuit prefect's room on that floor, the so-called adult supervisor. And that Jesuit was a, uh, a priest by the name of Father John Crowley, um, a faculty member, and just so happened to be the Jesuit prefect of, of Lehigh II. Um, great story, but what kind of elevates this story um, in, in, in folk and in legend is the fact that there is evidence that it actually existed. And here's the money shot. Isn't that cool? Um, the bricking took place in Lehigh or outside Lehigh 217. Um, you can kind of see the, uh, the number of the, of the room. You can walk by that room today. Trust me, the cinder blocks have been torn down. Um, but what adds additional humor to this story is that when the building contractor who was working on the Loyola project was called the next day to dismantle the wall and free the fuming, you can only imagine, the fuming Father Crowley, the contractor found the work so good and so professional that he actually offered to hire the student masons on the spot. Now, who says 
a liberal arts education can't get you anywhere. Here's an example of it in, in, in prime use. Um, the biggest irony of all of this is that this particular incident took place the night before the seniors' final exam as undergraduates of Holy Cross. What was the subject matter of that exam? Ethics. This is ethics in motion, people, right here. Fun story. Now, I want to go from one architectural campus feat to another. And this particular story begins with the building of the Holy Cross football program. Um, if you were able to catch the first part of this tour back in April, we talked about baseball um, in the 1890s and at the turn of the 20th century really being the preeminent college sport. Um, but as the 20th century began to wear on, football more and more became the popular college sport. Um, and especially in the 1940s and in the 1950s, Holy Cross became elevated, its, its program became elevated, not only on a regional, but on a national level as well. Um, and these are some fun, fun photos that I like to, uh, to showcase that kind of, uh, that highlight that era. Um, the photo on the upper left, um, I believe, was the 1951 Holy Cross Harvard football game. Um, I like to showcase because you could just see the crowd. That that's fit and field. It's just a it's a packed house. Um, the photo on the the bottom right, selfishly, I like to put in there. Um, that's from 1942. That's the historic Holy Cross upset of Boston College at Fenway Park. Um, I, I put that there for two reasons. Number one, again, to show the crowds. I mean, Fenway was packed that day. Um, but then also, take a look at the scoreboard. I love it. Final score, Holy Cross 55, BC 12. We put a pasting on the Eagles that day. Um, and that 42 game was the, was the infamous Coconut Grove game, um, that terrible um, tragedy that took place after. Um, in, on January 1st, 1946, Holy Cross actually played in the Orange Bowl um, down in Miami. We, we played the University of Miami. Um, and that particular year, um, in the fall of 45, Holy Cross football was ranked as high as number 10 in the country. Think of that, number 10 in the country. Um, so football had really, really saw uh, began to rise um, uh, regionally but then also nationally as well um, and this is one of my favorites in September of 1953 the first football game to be nationally televised from New England you guessed it Holy Cross versus Dartmouth and we had a good day that day we beat the Big Green 28 to 6 um, so both fans at the gate and also fans beginning to watch on TV um, elevated our football program, but also elevated our college um, regionally and nationally. So this is where this story's going. This aerial view was taken around 1958. Um, the prior fall, so in the fall of 1957, the Massachusetts Department of Public Works, the DPW, disclosed a plan where they intended to build an interstate highway through the lower part of campus, essentially taking the athletic fields by eminent domain. Um, the plan, um, the original plan, had the interstate going roughly 20 yards behind Kimball Hall. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a graphic design specialist, um, but the purple line that I put on the bottom, that roughly, roughly shows where the original proposed interstate highway was to go. So that would have cut off the whole bottom area of our campus, um, really impacting our, our athletic fields, fit and field, 
um, especially the football field, especially and the track. You can, you can make out the track um, located just a level below um, Kimball Hall. Um, and this plan and the ensuing debate um, would drag on for five years. Um, a, a very young Father Raymond Swords um, would take over the presidency of Holy Cross in 1960. He would be dragged into this controversy as well. Um, and over that four, four or five year span, um, it truly became a legal and a financial struggle, but also a town gown controversy um, between the college and Worcester, or between the college and the state. Um, from Holy Cross's perspective, um, the questions that the college was asking, that our representation was asking was, would Holy Cross be entitled to compensation equal to both the cost of the land that would be taken and the cost to relocate fit and field to another location. And there were a few other proposals in mind, some at the very top of the hill, some across the street, um, what they referred to as consequential damages. So would the college be entitled to the land itself and to the cost to relocate our, our athletic facilities? Um, the DPW and the city of Worcester, on the other hand, claimed that Holy Cross was, quote, standing in the way of progress um, and condoning any other plan to move the interstate highway, claiming that it would destroy local factories, destroy local businesses, and how dare this, um, this college on a hill um, try to mess with, with the lives of, of Worcester residents. Um, so this this found itself played out in public hearings. Um, it found itself played out in the local press, um, in the regional press, both sides kind of planting their, their, their flags. Um, and it wasn't until December 1962 um, when the DPW eventually decided, all right, we're going we're gonna to punt on this. And they chose what became known as the Northerly Plan, which this, this screen kind of roughly shows. Um, the Northerly Plan is essentially the bending of 290 around Fit and Field. Um, the, the purple at the bottom is my rough attempt at showing the original, the original route. Um, this is what was originally, uh, eventually um, settled upon. Um, the, the, the rationale from the DPW and the state was that after doing some careful estimations and assessments, they decided that by going the northerly route, extending the highway, around the stadium actually cost less than the original plan um, and potentially reimbursing the college for those expenses. Um, now in the end, the state only took two small partials of Holy Cross land, forcing a reorientation of the baseball field. Um, but to this day, you know, if you're up in a helicopter, if you see an aerial, 290 does bend around fit and field. Um, and that is kind of the, the story behind it. Um, you know, what's, what's, interesting, what's interesting is um, a, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Horan of the Boston real estate firm Meredith and Grew, he was the one who kind of tipped the scales um, and through his assessment of the college land, um, he's the one who tipped the scales for having the DPW kind of go the route it did. Um, he was a Harvard man, so it's it's kind of interesting that you know a Harvard man, with the help of a lot of Holy Cross advocates, but a Harvard man kind of tipped the scales and benefited the college. You know, let's let's fast forward to the early years of Holy Cross, where um, you know the college couldn't even get a charter from the state of Massachusetts um, because of anti-Catholic bias. So it's. It's amazing how, um, you know, in, in the ensuing century or so, um, perceptions had, had changed and, and the college really became a, a, at least a formidable player on the state level. Um, but this is a cool, this is a cool photo I like to show, show, show off. Um, 
with that, I want to, um, I've, got a, I've got another question for the group. Um, let me pull this up. I've got another pop quiz, so to speak. All right, I'm pulling this up right now. All right, I promised you this would be interactive. Um, you should see a question on your screen. Excluding Alumni Hall, what is the oldest existing building named after a lay person or persons? Um, remember, we talked about Alumni Hall. We can all claim ownership to that. What is the oldest existing building named after a lay person? I'll just pause for a minute. Give your best answer. Give it another second or so. All right, the answers are coming in. In the poll, share the results. Haberlin. 34%. We've got many votes for Hogan, O'Neill, Millard. This is a fun one. I wanted to try to think of a, a hard question that might stump, stump everyone. If you, if you said O'Neill, you are correct. Opened in 1951 as the biology building, very descriptive, the biology building, um, the space was renamed O'Neill Memorial Hall eight years later in 1959 in honor of the family of alumnus William F. O'Neill from the class of 1907, founder of the General Tire and Rubber Company. Um, then, as it is now, it's the home to the college's biology department, which still has an exceptional, exceptional academic tradition um, in, in academia. Um, but O'Neill was the first building to be named after a layperson, technically his family, the O'Neill Memorial Hall. But several of you mentioned Hogan. Um, this is where our story is going to take us next. Another notable building named after a layperson, the Hogan Campus Center. Um, it opened in 1967, um, so a little over a decade after O'Neill. Um, it was named after Henry M. Hogan, class of 1918, vice president and general counsel of General Motors and national chair of the Holy Cross Fund. Um, the multi-story social and recreational center was described by then college president, Father Swords, as the living room of the campus. Um, and even today, 50, almost 55 years later, the building continues to serve as the hub of campus activity. Um, there you can find the offices of student affairs, um, many different student organizations, Cool Beans Coffee Shop, the Holy Cross Bookstore, etc. cetera. Um, but along those lines of serving as the, 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 the living room of the campus, this is a fun picture I like to showcase. Um, in the early days of the Hogan Campus Center, in the basement, there was an eight lane bowling alley. Pretty neat, pretty neat. Um, it would cost 40 cents for a lane um, with 10 cents shoe rental. Um, today, that same space, talking about evolving with the times and the needs, is the Crossroads Dining Facility or the Campus Pub. Um, you know, you can still see Kind of the ceiling structure. Um, it'd be fun to have a bowling alley back on campus. Um, so 10 cents for shoes, 40 cents for a lane. Now you probably couldn't even get a cup of ice for, for 40 cents. Um, but just a multi-use, um, multi-use space. That's a fun picture. I think that was taken in 1970, um, if I'm correct. Basement area of Hogan. Um, but there's another part of Hogan that I want to showcase, and it's actually outside the building. And you probably have walked past this countless times. Um, I know I have. I know I have. Um, but tucked away at the traffic island, as you enter the building from the parking lots, sits a pretty nondescript stone memorial dedicated 
to one of our most noteworthy alumni, John Power of the class of 1941. Um, you can easily miss it. There's kind of tree growth over it. I took these photos myself um, a few weeks ago um, on a very quiet Holy Cross campus. Um, but the monument dedicated to the young Marine First Lieutenant, a Worcester native, was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for combat heroism in the Pacific's Marshall Islands during the Second World War. Now the memorial pays tribute not only to First Lieutenant Power, but also celebrates the fact that a Navy destroyer was commissioned in his honor, the USS Power pictured on the, uh, on the bottom right. Um, that destroyer is now decommissioned, um, but this memorial, um, this monument kind of pays tribute um, to First Lieutenant Power and the fact that, that the Navy thought so highly of him that they commissioned a destroyer in his name. Um, now, what's really fascinating is First Lieutenant Power is one of three Congressional Medal of Honor recipients with direct connections to Holy Cross. An amazing statistic. The Medal of Honor is the highest and most prestigious personal military decoration awarded to service members who have distinguished themselves by acts of valor. Now it was first bestowed during the Civil War um, and since then roughly 3,500 Americans have been awarded the honor. They are small numbers in comparison to the tens of millions of men and women who have served in the U.S. armed forces over the years. So the fact that three um, people with Holy Cross connections have received this honor is, is quite amazing. And there they are. You know, we've talked about First Lieutenant Power, class of 1941. On the right, Father Joseph T. O'Callaghan, faculty member in the mathematics department, was awarded the honor for heroism aboard the aircraft carrier, the USS Franklin, during World War II. The first chaplain to ever receive that honor. And after the war, he did return to campus um, as a professor and as a chaplain. And in the middle, Thomas G. Kelly, class of 1960, Navy captain who received the honor for heroism during the Vietnam War. Now these men are examples of the high values that Holy Cross holds dear, teaching its students to be thoughtful, courageous, and responsive to the needs of others, ideals that still live on today. Now service to country, and service to others can take many forms, especially as it relates to social justice, a key component of our college's mission. And this is a photo um, that I certainly wanted to share. Taken in November, 1962, Dr. Martin Luther King addressed a packed field house on campus. Now at the time he was, he was known um, this was a few years after the Montgomery bus boycott, um, but a little less than a year before the March on Washington and the famous I Have a Dream speech. So he was known, but he was not as nationally famous as he, was, as he would become a few months later. Now, in that 62 speech on campus, Dr. King talked about how we needed to work together to end the evils of racism, and discrimination and to help each other out along the way. It wasn't a white versus black issue. Um, it's not us against them. It's just us, collectively us. Um, now his death, a little over five years later, rocked the country and definitely rocked the Holy Cross campus. Um, and Father Swords, president at the time, um, shortly after the death of Dr. King in April of 68, announced a memorial scholarship fund for minority students in an effort to boost the college's enrollment. In the spring of 68, there were only nine minority students on campus at the time. Now that fund 
was, was to be sustained by offerings from students, from faculty, and from administrators. It was truly a grassroots in-house funding effort. Um, so you've got a fund. Now, how do you, how do you fill the fund? Um, a, the newly appointed academic dean, Father John Brooks, pictured on the, uh, on the right, um, he was young. He was only in his 40s at the time. Um, newly appointed academic dean was tasked with traveling up and down the East Coast that spring and that summer of 68, frantically recruiting African-American students for that scholarship. Um, and through Father Brooks being Father Brooks, through his persuasion, through his eloquence, he successfully recruited 19 men to join an overwhelmingly white campus in the fall of 68. So in just a few months, he was able to encourage 19 men to enroll that fall. Um, and among these students are some of the college's most prominent alumni, Clarence Thomas, class of 71, future Supreme Court Justice, Edward P. Jones, class of 72, who would go on to win a Pulitzer Prize for Literature, Ted Wells, class of 72, who would become one of the nation's most successful defense attorneys, and Stanley Grayson, class of 72, future New York City deputy mayor. Um, now this recruitment effort and its impact, not only on the life trajectories of these students, but on the Holy Cross campus and its future, um, and also the campus's attitudes toward race and racism are chronicled in the critically acclaimed book, Fraternity by author Diane Brady. It was published in 2012. There's a picture of it in the upper left. That is a terrific read if you haven't had a chance. It's one that brings to light without much sugarcoating the college's complicated record with race and social justice. Um, a wonderful read and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, the photo on the, on the bottom, uh, bottom left um, is, is, is a neat one. Um, that's alumnus Art Martin on the, on the left, class of 1970, the founding chairman of the Black Student Union. Um, and on the right is Ted Wells, class of 72, the founding vice chairman of the, uh, of the Black Student Union. Um, and then the photo of, of Father Brooks. I, I love that photo. I mean, when I, my, my, um, my remembrance of Father Brooks um, is, a, is of an older man um, with a robust voice and a strong spirit. Um, so to think that, you know, this, this young priest um, with growing responsibilities on campus only in his 40s was able to pull off this recruitment effort is, is quite profound. So I wanted to, to share that photo as well and to, to, to bring credit to him and, and, and the work that he did over the years. Um, now those 19 African-American students recruited by Father Brooks lived scattered throughout campus their first academic year. So that would have been the 68-69 academic year, a situation in hindsight, which they found very, very lacking. So the majority of those 19 students asked to live together to provide a sense of community and support. Um, college officials with, with Father Brooks closely in the mix approved the idea of a shared space and ultimately the Black Corridor, as it was known, was created on the fourth floor of Healy Hall the following year the fall of 69. Um, and as, as minority enrollment continued to grow, not only that academic year, but the year after, um, the Black Corridor um, grew in size. So what started up on the fourth floor of Lehigh moved down to the third floor. Um, and the, the, the corridor, to give it a sense of identity, soon sported the red, black and green stripes of the African liberation flag painted all along its hallways. And those paintings are still there. This is a hidden in plain sight gem on campus. Now it's located in the basement of Healy Hall. 
Um, but today, those painted stripes, as this, as this picture shows, um, represent a lasting legacy to those pioneering students. Um, you can still see that today. Um, now, there's another group of pioneering students that I want to highlight. And this story takes us to the basement of Dianin Library. Um, now, Dianin, as we talked about on part one of this tour back in April, opened its doors in 1927 as the college's main library, a grand building located right at the top of Linden Lane. Now, nestled in the basement at the end of a very nondescript hallway is what's called the Levis Browsing Room, a cozy spot that is often used for study space and academic gatherings. Think book discussions, visiting faculty lectures, etc. And with its wood trimmings and old bookshelves and smell, this location looks like one you might find in the board game Clue. You know, think Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the Levis browsing room. Um, now in the room above the old fireplace, and I've circled it in, in the top right, there is a plaque that lists the names of past Fenwick scholars. What's the Fenwick scholars? Um, the Fenwick scholar program is the highest academic honor the college bestows on a student. Now since 1967, Fenwick scholars have designed and participated in a rigorous academic project over the course of their senior year. Now the names etched on the plaque have gone on to amazing careers, exploits, um, and their, their, their professional exploits, their personal exploits have touched the lives of many in the fields of medicine, law, education, you name it. These are our best and our brightest students. Now for the first decade or so of the Fenwick Scholar Program, the plaques highlight what you could define as, as ordinary names, such as Richard or Daniel or Edward. But beginning in 1975, you see names like Elizabeth Pfeiffer, class of 75, Joyce Walsack, class of 76, and Joyce O'Shaughnessy, class of 77. One of the first visible campus testaments that I know of highlighting co-education. And it's nestled in the basement of the library. Um, now in the fall of 1972, the gates of Linden Lane were officially opened to female students. Now, while the inaugural class of women, four year time on campus, would graduate in 1976, the first female graduates of the college actually walked across the commencement stage in 1974. A group of 15 students transferred in as juniors, as rising juniors, after completing their sophomore years elsewhere. Now, that first four-year co-ed class, class of 76, about 30% of that class was female, a number that would grow steadily over the years until the fall of 85. So about 13 years after Holy Cross went co-ed, in the fall of 85, the freshman class of 1989 was welcomed, and the class was 58% female, the first time that, that there were more women than men who enrolled at Holy Cross. Today, these are fall 2019. Um, so this past fall, the student body on campus was 53% female, 47% male. Um, so the, the, the balance has, has definitely equalized very quickly from when coeducation started in the fall of 72. Now, one could argue that coeducation, now approaching its 50th anniversary, believe it, 50 years, was one of the best decisions that Holy Cross ever made. Not only did it elevate our academic status as an institution of higher learning, it also enriched the campus experience for generations of future crusaders to come. One of the best, if not the best decision Holy Cross has made. Um, 
And now I want to end, um, you know, as we're looking forward, I want to end by taking one last glance backward. Um, and for this, I want to credit um, Ed O'Donnell. He's class of 86. Um, he was a student of Father Kuznevsky's. He's the current chair of the history department at Holy Cross. Um, I often hear him quoting Mark Twain, who famously said, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And here's an example. I love this photo. I love this aerial. I showed this back in April during the first part of the tour. Um, as far as we know, this is the oldest aerial um, photograph of campus. It was taken in 1918. Um, and, and I want to put this up to, to explain a larger point. So picture yourselves on campus in the fall of 1918. Um, World War I is raging. Um, the US was an active participant in the war and the Holy Cross campus was turned upside down. Um, many upperclassmen, junior, seniors, a few sophomores were serving in the armed forces and stationed elsewhere either domestic or they were over in Europe. Um, those who were on campus, and it was a small few, um, saw the opening date of the fall, which was supposed to begin um, in the fall of, of, 19, of 18, was supposed to begin in late September. It was pushed back a whole month due to the epidemic of the Spanish influenza. Now, many students, because of the Spanish flu, and because of the war, didn't return to campus until January of 1919 when the war ended. So there was kind of a partial fall semester, but the majority of students didn't return back or couldn't return back until January. Um, so the senior class of 1919 essentially had their final year cut to just five and a half months from January to June of 1919. Now the students had many campus traditions. You know, every class, every era has campus traditions. Well, the class of 1919 saw many of those traditions canceled on account of the shortened academic school year. Things like class banquets, smokers, which were becoming popular um, in, in the early days of the 1920s. Um, now, while this environment was a tough ending to their Holy Cross careers, the class of 1919 nonetheless persisted. And most of them would go on to successful careers. They would become Holy Cross graduates. They would build beautiful families of their own and they would carry on the ideals they learned during their very, very non-traditional time at Holy Cross. Well, 101 years later, history may not be repeating, but it's very much rhyming. Our beautiful class of 2020 saw their senior year interrupted and cut short due to, due, due to the current pandemic. But just like the class of 1919 before them, these young graduates are showing considerable strength and adaptability. Um, and I put this quote, I found this quote um, in the Purple Patcher of 1919. It's the class yearbook for the class of 19. Um, near the beginning of that, of that yearbook, um, the class wrote a very beautiful note to their professors. Um, and part of the note reads, in our quest for knowledge and truth and character, we hope by noble ideals and manly characters to reflect some credit upon 19, upon ourselves. Well, a century later, we have no doubt that our young class of 2020, through their time on Mount St. James, developed similar ideals and similar characters that will serve them well now and into the future. So the class of 2020, their ending may have been unexpected at Holy Cross, but their path ahead is certainly limitless. 
and we wish them the best of luck. If they can have the success and the beautiful lives that the class of 1919 enjoyed, um, they're, they're doing pretty well. So we certainly wish them well. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pause and thank you for your attention, for your support. Um, and I'm happy to take, uh, take some questions that we have until, until our time is, is gone. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up some questions that might've been sent along. And if you could think of any more, please share them. Um, this is definitely a fun, a fun endeavor. Um, let's see. We have an interesting question. Can you touch on the relationship with Georgetown? Um, it's an interesting one. Um, Georgetown um, is the oldest Catholic institution in the United States, so certainly the oldest um, Jesuit institution. Um, many of our um, early um, administrators and early professors those first few decades of Holy Cross had connections um, to uh, to Georgetown. Either they themselves went there, or they were a part of the faculty. Um, and many of our early graduates of Holy Cross um, would go on. Some of them to enter the priesthood. Some of them enter the Society of Jesus, and would go on to teach at Georgetown as well. Um, What's interesting about our relationship with Georgetown is um, technically for the first 20 years or so of the college um, offering degrees, um, we weren't offering Holy Cross degrees because the college, Holy Cross, wasn't able to get a charter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It could be for a variety of reasons. Some people claim it was anti-Catholic bias. Some people claim other other reasons. Um, so for the first 20 years or so, if you're technically a Holy Cross grad, you were getting a Georgetown diploma. Um, that changed in 1965, or excuse me, in 1865, after the Civil War, um, when the college received its own charter. Um, but that's kind of an interesting connection between Holy Cross and Georgetown. Um, on the Georgetown campus, one of their iconic buildings, think of it along the lines of a, of a Fenwick or an O'Kane, um, is Healy Hall. Um, you see it in a lot of brochures on the website. Well, Healy Hall is named after a Holy Cross guy, um, Patrick Healy, um, of the famous Healy brothers. His brother was, was James Healy, our first valedictorian. Um, Patrick would enter the Jesuits and get connected with the Jesuits in the Maryland area and would go on to serve as president of Georgetown for many years. So that's, that's kind of another Holy Cross Georgetown connection. Um, let's see, we've got a, we got a question about com compulsory mass. Ooh, this is a good one. Um, I know we didn't touch on the chapel today, um, but for pretty much in its early since we were founded, you know, liturgy and, and kind of liturgical life have been central to Holy Cross. And, um, you know, in, in the later stages of the 19th century, well into the 20th century, um, students had to go to Mass. Um, you know, they would have an assigned um, seat in, a, in, in an assigned row and an assigned pew, um, and they would have to go. Um, and the attendance would be taken, and if you weren't there, there would be repercussions. Um, and that was well in, was in existence well into the uh, 1930s, into the 1940s. It eased up a little bit during the Second World War, shortly after the Second World War. Um, and part of it was because we, we didn't have enough space. Um, so instead of requiring students to go to mass um, every day, it became like an every other day thing until what became known as the Mary Chapel, um, was renovated and added below, you know, in the basement level, below St. Joseph's. That freed up some space, so daily compulsory mass was reinstituted, and it wasn't until 1962, early in Father Swords's administration, um, that he disbanded compulsory mass, um, citing a, 
um, you know, sign of the times, citing, um, you know, what he was hearing from his superiors in Rome and the Catholic Church in, in general. Um, no, it's, it's interesting. I think like in his memo or in his note to the campus community, he said something like, you know, you're not required to go to mass anymore, but we strongly recommend it on a daily basis. But that was, that was in 1962 um, when, when compulsory mass went away. Um, let's see, what other, what other questions? Where can we access the recorded version of this webinar? Um, well, I did, I did record this. Um, as well as the first version, both of them, well, this one soon, but the first one is available on the uh, alumni website um, under virtual resources. Um, if you click on that, you'll see the, uh, the link to the, to the recorded version of part one and probably in another day or two, at least by early next week, um, part two will be up there as well. So that is, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, when is number three? Ken, I can, from Ken Padgett, class of 66. I don't know. Maybe after two, I'm going to get the hook. I, I don't know about that. Um, I hope you're enjoying this. I really do. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, we have a, um, an interesting question about the field house. You know, we, we, we pointed out um, Dr. Martin Luther King um, giving a speech at the field house. What are some other notable people um, who came by the field house. Um, well, the Who uh, famously performed uh, for Homecoming in 1969 at the field house. Um, the Jay Giles Band performed there. Um, Jane Fonda um, was a speaker at the field house. Um, you know, so a lot of interesting acts and kind of public figures have come by the field house over the years. Um, Let's see. Interesting question. What, what's your favorite old wives tale? Um, oh my goodness. My favorite old wives tale that I haven't mentioned. Um, it's kind of related. Um, I don't know if it's my favorite old wives tale, but here's, here's, here's an, an addition. Um, part of the reason why a swimming pool um, wasn't added to the basement of O'Kane um, and I talked about the drainage system. And the reason for that is the college couldn't afford a deep enough drain to prevent flooding, to prevent um, leakage. And the reason for the leakage is because um, there are so many natural springs on the Holy Cross campus. You might not know it today. They're buried, you know, many feet under the ground. Um, but what became the, the College of the Holy Cross is built on um, Pakachoag Hill, um, which um, is loosely translated from Native American, um, the Hill of Many Springs. Um, and that is, that is evident. And, um, you know, I, I, that, that's one reason why there isn't a pool or there wasn't um, a, an original pool in O'Kane. Um, I've also heard that during the construction of uh, the Hogan Campus Center, so this would have been in the early to mid 60s. Um, construction was held back in many different phases because as contractors kept digging down, they were, they were running into some natural springs um, that they had to kind of work around. So, um, you know, that's kind of an interesting story that I'd love to learn a bit more about, um, that there are these kind of natural, natural springs on campus. And who knows if we can, if we can find a way to tap them, maybe that can be a cool revenue stream for the college. You know, instead of Poland Springs, we can call it Holy Cross Springs or, or something like that. Um, let's see. Um, from Karen Ciancis, was the pit an area where ROTC had a big auditorium? I believe so, Karen. Um, after after the, 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 the gymnasium um, left, um, I think it was reconfigured for, uh, for the ROTC program before their, their facilities in, in Carlin Hall were built. Um, and then kind of the theater department took it over. Um, so I believe that that general area there um, was, was used for ROTC. Um, let's see, where's the open space in O'Kane? 
I don't remember it from 87 when I graduated. There were kind of two open spaces. Number one, there was a large 800 person auditorium, um, kind of a multi-use, used for classes, used for guest lectures, speakers, things like that. Um, that was eventually reconfigured into Fenwick Theater um, before the, um, the, the Cantor Art Gallery was added. Um, you know, if you're kind of entering O'Kane from Linden Lane, um, that's where the Cantor Art Gallery currently is, is housed. There was some open space there. Um, you know, the, the neat thing about O'Kane, um, Fenwick, other old buildings is they have really adapted over the, over the years. Um, question, are there any um, Holy Cross buildings that are um, on the historical registry list? Yes, that is a good question. Um, this is kind of a fun kind of uh, pub trivia question. There are two Holy Cross buildings on the National Registry of Historic Places, um, Fenwick Hall and O'Kane Hall. Um, I know that there has been some talk to try to get fit and field on that list as well. I don't know if the criteria is different because it's an outdoor space versus an indoor space, but currently there are two. Fenwick and O'Kane are, are on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, let me see. Interesting, uh, Joe Tobin. I think the springs by the field house were responsible for hepatitis outbreak in 69. <laughs> Maybe, um, I think there's a lot of theories and thoughts as to how, how that came about. Um, certainly gave the college a lot of national attention. Um, let's see. Um, oh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end with this because I know we're up against, the, up against time. Um, a question about the observatory. Um, and I mentioned the barn. Is that the same barn um, where Holy Cross basketball would practice? Um, from what I can tell, yes, um, that there was an old barn used for agricultural purposes that was uh, configured into an indoor basketball gymnasium um, in the late 30s into the 40s. And that became kind of the home practice gym of Holy Cross basketball. So luminaries such as George Cafton, class of 49, Bob Cousy, class of 50, they would practice there. Um, and then they would play their games in, in Worcester. We didn't have a facility to, to host games, um, but, but, but the barn was used for practice. As far as I can tell, that was the barn where the, uh, where the observatory, Mount Connolly, as it became known, was placed. Um, and then when plans for Loyola Hall came online, um, the barn got torn down and Mount Connolly, the observatory, was plucked off of that barn and then placed nearby where, where it was in existence for another few years or so. So um, yes, there's kind of the intertwined, you could call it star-crossed paths between Kuzi, Kafton, and the moon and the stars. That is, that is true. Um, I know we're, we're up against the time. I promised I would keep this to about 75 minutes or so. Um, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. Um, for any of you fathers or grandfathers or fathers at heart, I certainly wish you a happy Father's Day weekend. Um, and uh, in the meantime, be well and, um, you know, let's, let's keep the Holy Cross spirit going. Thank you all very, very much.